This all started when I received Cryptonomicon by Neil Stevenson as a Christmas gift. As a rule, I read every book that I own, but also I was really excited because I loved Snow Crash in high school. But Stevenson really let me down with this beast of a book. Somewhere in its more than 1,000 page glory, Cryptonomicon's protagonist, a scientist, develops a hypothesis about how his productivity is tied to sex, and the book gives you a nice plot that demonstrates the relationship between the two. And when I say plot, I mean an actual graph. Which got me thinking, what if I took this seriously for a second? Unfortunately, we don't have enough data to plot the cumulative number of lovers and scientific output as functions of time to see if there's a relationship between their love lives and their breakthroughs, but still, for some reason, I thought it'd be <laughs> extremely funny to spend weeks poring over the recorded history of every historical scientist's personal life. And now I have enough data to rank the great scientists according to their sluttiness. The thing with ranking them is that the metric can't only be the number of lovers that someone's had. Slut is a consubstantial thing. People call you a slut for wearing revealing clothing, talking openly about sex, making dirty jokes, consuming pornography, being flirtatious. None of those things mean that you've had many sexual partners. These are by and large normal, common things that adult people do, but kind of inevitably, they contribute to the vibe. So part of the scoring system is five points for behavior and another five points for revealing, showy, or otherwise prov provocative attire. These points are added to the number of lovers, whether or not that relationship was consummated, for a cumulative sluttiness score. I use the word slut because most of the terms used to describe men in this way are laudatory, like stud or Casanova, or they carry a negative connotation, like libertine. To me, slut is neutral and even a bit lighthearted, which is what I'm going for, not to condemn or commend a figure's sluttiness, but to quantify it. Now I know I just said I'm not here to pontificate, I will hold philandering to some kind of moral standard, because someone has to, and I know for a fact that the Feynman apologists among us won't. So I've added a second axis for ethical and non-ethical sluttery. If the candidate's open and honest with their partners and generally acknowledges and respects their humanity, they get a positive score. It seems like a pretty low bar. If they pursue minors, deceive or abuse their partners, engage in any non-consensual behavior, etc., that reflects negatively. And if there isn't any information available to judge for a particular physicist, I'll leave them at a zero. As an aside, I move Brahe and Schrodinger slightly up along the ethics axis solely for better legibility for this graph. So without further ado, let's begin. Copernicus, known for his heliocentric model of the solar system, didn't have a wife, lover, or children that we know of, but he did have a live-in housekeeper named Anna Schilling. Two bishops of Varmia saw Schilling as his mistress, and continually pressed him to stop having relations with her. It's unclear if their assumptions were true, so I've included an error bar to reflect our uncertainty. In any case, this was pretty scandalous at the time. He scores a 0 out of 5 on behavior and dress because there's really not information that we have on those fronts, but that gives Copernicus a cumulative score of 1. Galileo Galilei is known for his support of heliocentrism and the resulting persecution from the church, despite being a pretty devout Roman Catholic. He didn't marry either, but he did have three children outside of wedlock with Marina Gamba. Given this, he gets a 1 out of 5 in behavior, because the dude got physical outside of wedlock despite the stigma in 1600s Italy. However, he saw his illegitimate daughters as practically unmarriageable, so he sent them to a convent to live out the rest of their lives. I'm docking points for that on the ethics axis, because that's just not very cool. But I do understand that social attitudes against children that were born out of wedlock were strong back then, so sorry, dude. In total, Galilei scores a 2.
Oppenheimer is best known for his role in the Manhattan Project developing the atomic bomb. While single, he had a somewhat scandalous affair with Catherine Puning, who divorced her then-husband to marry Oppenheimer. His FBI file contains gossip about Oppenheimer having a relationship with a man, but this is only gossip. We do know that Oppenheimer had at least two other affairs, one with his communist ex-girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, and one with his friend's wife, Ruth Tolman. He wasn't open with his wife about these relationships, so I'm giving him a slightly negative score for his ethics. He was also a chain smoker, which on its face has nothing to do with sluttiness, but I feel like it should be mentioned and also taken into consideration. I'll give him a 1 out of 5 for behavior. Oppenheimer in total scores a 4. Tycho Brahe was known for how accurate his astronomical observations were, in the 16th century no less. As a 20-year-old, he got into an argument with someone over who was a better mathematician. This escalated into a sword duel, as it sometimes does, and he ended up with a scar straight across his face and a prosthetic nose. This isn't really slutty, so much as it's interesting, and, you know, I just thought the mathematicians out there should take some ideas from it. Anyways, he had children with Kirsten Jorgen's daughter, whom he couldn't formally marry because she was a commoner but he did it anyway. He was met with disapproval from his family and from the church for this non-divinely sanctioned marriage. There's also a popular rumor during his life that he had an affair with King Christian IV's mother, which combined with the former earns him a 3 out of 5 on his behavior. We don't know if the rumor is true, so I added an error bar, and the total score that he gets is a 5. Aristotle's best known for his philosophy, but his ideas about motion, elements, causes, and optics also had a significant impact on pre-enlightenment physics. He married Pythias the Elder, and after she died, he had a child with her Pilus of Stagira. According to a 10th century encyclopedia called the Suda, he may have also had a young male lover called Pelephetus of Abydus. I'm giving him a 3 out of 5 on sartorial choices solely because of the statue. That's far more skin showing than what I feel comfortable with. Actually, oh my god, this is amazing. This puts Aristotle at 5 units of cumulative sluttiness. Stephen Hawking did significant theoretical work that predicted the emission of radiation by black holes and became quite the celebrity scientist. He was married twice, first to Jane Wilde, then to one of his nurses, Elaine Mason. Both marriages ended in divorce. He ranks higher on this list because he visited a California swingers club and other similar venues, such as Stringfellows. I assume that means he was well in touch with his sexuality, so I'll allow a 5 out of 5 in the behavior category, putting him at a score of 7. Johannes Kepler is best known for his titular laws of planetary motion, Kepler's Laws. He almost didn't marry because he was busy publishing his research, but his first wife, Barbara Muller, eventually did marry him. She died in 1611, and this is where it starts to get slutty. He courted 11 women over a two-year span, treating the search for a new wife like a math problem. That problem today is known as the secretary problem, and I've included a paper about it in my sources. Check it out if you want. He eventually settled on Susanna Rudinger, the fifth candidate, which is actually the solution to the 11 person secretary problem. It's the number of interviews you should do to maximize your probability of finding the best candidate, for Kepler, for finding the best wife. Anyways, he didn't do anything out of wedlock, to my knowledge, but courting 11 people over a short time span is frankly pretty impressive. I also give him 1 out of 5 on sartorial choices because of the accentuated waistline in this portrait. All in all, Kepler receives a 13, which is leaps ahead of the physicists we've looked at so far. Love Landau was an impressive theoretical physicist. He received the Nobel Prize for his theory of superfluidity, and he wrote an excellent textbook series by Lifshitz. We know that he was a proponent of free love, and he only married his wife, Cora, on the condition that they were both free to pursue other relationships. Although she agreed not to be jealous, she was unhappy with this arrangement, and she released a memoir after his death that said as much. Landau's colleagues and former students 
said that while he was coquettish and he talked openly about relationships, you could count his affairs on your fingers. I'll put his number of lovers then as a number between 1 and 10, reflected in the error bars on his spot, although I'm highballing it a little bit because this is Landau. Since his openness about relationships and his flirtatiousness was notable enough to mention in biographies, I'm giving him a 5 out of 5 on behavior, and we know that he was open with his wife, and she agreed to having an open marriage at least at first, so I think Landau qualifies as an ethical slut. Landau ties with Kepler at 13 points. Albert Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, but he's better known for developing his theory of relativity. He broke up with his high school sweetheart, Marie, after he went to college and fell in love with one of his classmates, Maliva Merrick. He eventually married Merrick, but he was unfaithful. He wrote Marie about how he loved her and regretted having left her for Merrick. He also had an affair during this marriage with his first cousin, Elsa Lowenthal, which caused Einstein and Merrick to spend the last five years of their marriage living separately. After he divorced Merrick, he married Elsa, and according to his correspondence, he cheated on Elsa with six other women, including Betty Neumann, his secretary, Margaret Liebach, Estea Katz and Ellenbogen, Tony Mendel, and Ethel Michinowski. I say cheated because he discussed these affairs pretty openly with Elsa and his stepdaughter Margot in letters. After Elsa passed away, he had a brief relationship with the Russian spy Margarita Konenkova, but he didn't know about the spy part. These are all of Einstein's lovers that I know about. Given his earlier unfaithfulness to Merrick, I'm judging him slightly lower than a neutral zero on the ethics axis. As you can see from this picture of him lounging in a bathrobe, and this image of him wearing shorts that wouldn't have passed my high school dress code, Einstein deserves all five points in the sartorial choices category. As for his behavior, I'd say he's a three, on account of his uninhibited flirtations despite being married. This puts him at a grand total of 17. Which brings us to Richard Feynman. Feynman was a fine scientist. He won the Nobel Prize for his work in quantum electrodynamics, and he has an excellent series of lectures about physics. But he wasn't such a fine man. In his memoir, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, he explains how he became essentially a pickup artist. He convinced the worthless bitches, his words, at the bar to sleep with him. He also pretended to be an undergrad to get undergrad students to sleep with him. He asked his female students to nude model for him, which in the context of figure drawing is benign, but there is a power imbalance between a professor and a student. The list of questionable behavior continues. In his FBI file, his ex-wife testified that when she interrupted his calculus or his bongo sessions, he would fly into a violent rage, attack her, throw objects, and smash furniture. They divorced, not surprisingly, on grounds of cruelty. Under the totality of the evidence that we have, he scores pretty dang low in ethics. I know that having acknowledged what I just acknowledged, it will likely send Feynman fanboys after me to defend his honor, and I just want to say I'm not discounting how great of a scientist he was, or how great of a teacher. I'm just saying that he did bad things, and both of those things can be true. In calculating the number of partners that Feynman had, I had to make some estimates. His first wife and high school sweetheart was Arlen Greenbaum. She died of tuberculosis while he was working at Los Alamos on the bomb, and in his grief he had many dead wife rebounds, I don't know how many, but he said that they all seemed like ash. It's likely that he never really recovered from this loss, and no woman that he met seemed to live up to this romanticized image that he had of Greenbaum. This didn't stop him, though. At Cornell, where he was a professor, he hired sex workers and slept with the wives of physics grad students. He visited strip clubs to do work and to draw the dancers. Rose McSherry was his lover while he worked on quantum electrodynamics, but then he met and settled down with Mary Louise Bell. After they divorced because of the spousal abuse, among other things, he had a few girlfriends that stole money from him or other items from him. 
and after this stint, he married Gwyneth Howarth. They remained together until his death at 69. Nice. It's likely that I've underestimated the number of partners that he had, so I have a pretty big error bar reflecting that. When looking for pictures or texts that detailed his manner of dress, I stumbled upon an account of a royalty-themed party where Feynman dressed up as Queen Elizabeth II. According to this article, he stripped to raunchy music at the party's end, and I don't know about you, but for me, this is obviously a five for behavior. As far as revealing clothing goes, I'd say that his costume from Guys and Dolls is a five if I ever saw one. Feynman comes out with 24 cumulative sluttiness units. And last but not least, Schrodinger. Oh, Schrodinger. He won the Nobel Prize for the Schrodinger equation, but he did so much more than that. And the so much more seems to be largely falling in love with woman after woman after woman. I mean, where do I begin? He was pretty much polyamorous. For a large portion of his life, he lived with his wife and his partner. So you can assume that Annie knew about his numerous escapades and was mostly fine with it. I mean, she had her own partner that she visited regularly. Schrodinger's openness actually caused problems in his professional life, because colleagues at Cambridge and Princeton didn't really take too kindly to his open non-monogamy. After he moved to Dublin, though, he was more or less accepted, unconventional family and all. He kept a diary with dates, names, and comments about all of his romantic and sexual encounters, and he called this his ephemera day. I'll write you out a brief summary. So as you might have guessed, we actually could plot the cumulative number of partners as a function of time for Schrodinger and compare that to his research output and then examine local trends. But I'm not doing that because that sounds very hard. What's interesting here is that he didn't really view these encounters as sexual conquest. The dude just liked to fall in love, and it really didn't matter as much if he got sexual gratification from it. Neither did it matter if the object of his affections was married or a minor. Yep. He scores so low in ethics because he groomed a 14-year-old girl, Ify Younger. That he waited to sleep with her until she was 16 doesn't really make it better in my eyes. Later in life, he also tried to pursue a 12-year-old named Barbara, who was the family member of a colleague. Thankfully, that colleague shut him down almost immediately. Obviously, this is very non-ethical slut behavior. He also tended to ditch his partners immediately after they got pregnant, but it's mainly the grooming of children that puts Schrodinger on the same latitude as Feynman. Sorry to ruin your day, because finding this out certainly ruined mine. Back to the ranking. The behavior, the incessant love poems, the obsession with falling in love, gives him a 5 out of 5 nonetheless. And in the sartorial category, Schrodinger sweeps up all 5 points as well. According to his biography by Walter Moore, he would wear an open, short-sleeved shirt to give lectures at the University of Berlin, where professors were expected to wear a formal suit, white collar, and tie. I really don't know what's more provocative than this. He was also described as dressing flamboyantly with a fur coat and calf-length trousers with high socks. He lands 25 points in all, and I can confidently bestow upon him the title of sluttiest physicist, which I get the feeling he would accept. Congrats for making it to the end of this video. If you know of any physicists that I left out or want to dispute the scores that I've given, leave a comment and let me know. I'll maintain an errata sheet, which I'll link in the description. Catch you in the next video, and for all you physicists out there, whether you choose to be slutty or not, Make sure to keep it ethical.